morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's Asia Water Forum session on enhancing the economic value of water. My name is Suzanne Marsh. I am a water resources specialist in the South Asian Department of Environment, Natural Resources and Agricultural Division. And I will be this session's moderator. The key question for this session is how can we improve the productivity and economic use of water in the face of dwindling resources? Freshwater resources are dwindling at an alarming rate and water scarcity is expected to intensify as a result of climate change. In this session, we have speakers focusing on water and agriculture irrigation, which accounts for 70% of worldwide water use. As water becomes increasingly scarce with rising demand, water will need to be used as efficiently as possible by promoting robust water allocation regimes, water reuse, conservation practices and information technology. Boosting water productivity and economic use is important to reduce poverty, improve food security and support Asia's development. We have four speakers in this session, each with a 10 minute presentation. For the audience, please post your questions in the Q&A panel on the right hand side of your screen and we will address these after all the speakers have presented. I'd also like to acknowledge the young water professional reporting on the session, Hong Ha, is a, from the Energy, Water and Climate Change Researcher, Australia Mekong Partnership for Environmental Resources and Energy Systems. So I'd just like to head it over and introduce our first speaker for today. Her name is Dr. Rekha Saxena. She's a principal scientist at ICAR National Institute for Agriculture, Economics and Policy Research in New Delhi, India. Dr. Rekha has research experience of more than 15 years in publishing research papers, policy briefs, and book chapters. She has contributed through evidence-based policy insights based on novel multidisciplinary and multi-institutional approaches, starting from critical need of agricultural research, prioritization, evaluation, through to direct welfare of farmers in India. Recently, she has concentrated on market intelligence for handling price fertility and enhancing farmers' incomes. Her presentation today is on the virtual water trade in food commodities, mapping and sustainable options for rice cultivation in India. So over to you, Dr. Rekha. Thank you. Very good morning to all of you. Thank you, Susan, for giving me this opportunity. And I thank NEDB also for giving us this opportunity. So we did this study on trade-offs in virtual water trade and export advantages for rice cultivation in India at ICR and IAP. Uh, so when we talk about virtual water trade, uh, we have already talked about that this the concept of virtual water trade. It has recently got great attention in terms of policy parlance. And when we talk about the case of India, India is emerging as a major uh, export partner, as a major global partner in agricultural exports. And there are a few commodities which are actually catching our attention. But at the same time, sustainability concerns are also equally very, very important. So when we talk about agricultural exports, we have, we have actually the trade-offs between the agricultural exports and the sustainability concerns of the economy. We have a number of global studies as well as we have a number of national studies on virtual water exports and imports. And if people have this, uh, the academicians, researchers, stakeholders, they have been talking about this uh, concern for a long period of time. And this is now actually very, very important. And people have, studies have reported that rice is actually one of the most important commodities in agriculture from the perspective of virtual water trade. And studies, they have focused on trends, mapping, and they have talked about the issues in uh, irrigation, water footprints and all, but we find that the studies in complete virtual water ecosystem, they are practically non-existent in terms of Indian context. So our study basically focuses on uh, mapping of sustainable options for rice cultivation in India. So we are looking for an alternative crop geometry for rice cultivation because India has maintained a significant comparative advantage in rice uh, exports over a period of time. So we took four parameters for uh, identifying alternative crop geometry. We, we selected the rice surplus. We selected the groundwater extraction as one of the parameters. We selected rice productivity and we selected the productivity potential. Virtual water trade uh, was actually worked out by multiplying the 
volume of tray with the virtual water content of our traded commodities. So we selected number of food commodities and ultimately we focused on the complete rice ecosystem in Indian context. So virtual water content, the figures were actually drawn from the studies by Chepagin and Hoekstra and also uh, the, the Indian studies by uh, Kumar and Chen. And then we worked out the net water trade uh, by subtracting the virtual water imports from virtual water exports. And as we discussed that we, there are uh, trade-offs in the uh, uh, trade advantages and the sustainability concerns. So we also worked out the revealed comparative advantage in selected commodities, which is the ratio of uh, the share of a particular commodity in the national exports divided by the share of the, uh, the commodity at the global level. So this is the ratio which indicates what kind of trade advantages or export advantages do we have in terms of uh, global uh, trade context. We delineated entire country. The exercise was conducted at the district level. We have around uh, close to 700 districts. So we have taken on an earlier base. So we, the data was taken for around 700 districts of the country. We delineated the country into different zones on the based on the selected parameters. We took rice to surplus for each district, which is the difference, I mean, which is the, uh, which is the uh, ratio of the difference between the production and consumption in a particular district. And then the country was uh, delineated into deficit zone, surplus zone, and the major surplus zone. The idea was that because when we, we don't have disaggregated district level export data, so idea was that the export should come from the major surplus zone. So the major surplus zone would be, the, would be uh, kind of uh, exporting zones from the country. So we delineated the zone as a major surplus zone where we have more than 50% of the surplus. Groundwater exploitation, the researchers have uh, said that uh, the safe zone is uh, there when we have groundwater exploitation less than 70%. So we, we delineated the, the areas where we have less than 70% uh, uh, groundwater exploitation as safe zone, semi-critical between 70 to 90%, and critical zone where groundwater exploitation is more than 90%. But rice productivity growth and rice productivity potential were uh, uh, taken, and this exercise was conducted to see where we have, where which are the alternative pockets, where we where we have higher potential for uh, growth in uh, rice as a major commodity of the country. So there were certain areas where we found the negative growth, but those were of course a very few areas. Average productivity growth and this benchmark uh, of 1.2 percent was uh, taken as a national growth in last uh, eight years. High productivity growth uh, zones were we, where uh, we observed more than uh, national level uh, growth rate. And productivity potential, as we, we have, we are witnessing a lot of yield gaps, productivity gaps in rice cultivation. We, we had low productivity potential zone, moderate productivity potential zone, and high productivity potential zone. And then we delineated into three zones based on uh, certain uh, uh, percentages uh, driven from scientific uh, parameters. Low productivity below 15%, moderate between 16 to 30%, and uh, high productivity potential zone where we have 31% uh, uh, productivity, uh, more than 31% productivity potential. If we look at the trends in export and import of certain commodities from India, we find that rice is the most important commodity. And it has become particularly more important uh, in the current years. Uh, we, we, the India has exported around close to 20 million tons of rice uh, during 2021-22. Uh, so the figure there has been ex um, extremely uh, appreciable growth rate. We had around 15% growth rate in rice exports during last uh, five years. Other major commodities are also there, like maize is one of the important commodities. We have cane, uh, sugar, and then certain horticultural commodities, fruits, vegetables, spices are one of the products which are uh, exported from India. And in certain commodities, in rice, we, we actually hold around uh, one third of the global export shares. In turmeric also, the country is having a tremendous advantage in the global market. Spices, we are, in most of the spices, we are the number one exporters. Uh, in case of... Uh, in case of dried onion, also we have uh, export advantages. And uh, we, we, we multiply these volumes with the virtual water content of those commodities to arrive at the virtual water exports and virtual water imports of selected com commodities. And then we find that rice has emerged as the most important crop, which is consuming maximum water in the country and then leading to uh, maximum virtual water exports. And this is, the, this is the scenario of net virtual water trade in selected commodities. Here also we can see rice, rice emerges as the most important commodity in India. 
And revealed comparative advantages indicate that price, uh, India has maintained significant comparative advantage in price over a period of time. Though dry onion and turmeric had more advantage, but these uh, volumes are lesser, very less meager as compared to the rice commodity. And if we delineate the country into different zones, we find that this uh, transgenetic plain uh, consisting of this Punjab, Haryana, and the uh, northern states of the country, this is the major rice surplus zone. Uh, uh, and uh, in terms of groundwater exploitation, also this zone emerges as the most critical zone, apart from the arid zone consisting of states of uh, Rajasthan and some parts of Gujarat. So this is the most critical zone. So now we have been talking about shifting uh, or we find alternative uh, rice crop geometry in the country where we can move some of the rice area from this area to the other favorable areas of the uh, country. In terms of uh, rice growth rate, we find that uh, there are areas where we have high in Eastern India and Central India, which is also the rice ball of the country. We find that there has been high growth in terms of rice cultivation. There are certain pockets in Odisha, West Bengal, Madhya Pradesh, we have high, high growth in rice cultivation. And productivity potential in most of the states, it's actually moderate to uh, very high. So we have a lot of potential in these areas where in terms of technological interventions, we can shift some of, of the areas from which from the areas of transgenetic plain, Punjab, Haryana, and uh, uh, such regions. And then we can work on optimizing the water productivity, water resource, which is, which is one of the most crucial resource in the current context. And what could be the technological options in terms of if we need improved cultivars? If we talk about shifting of rice from Punjab and Haryana or transgenetic plain to central India and eastern India, we need actually the stress tolerant varieties because eastern India is actually facing the droughts. Eastern India is facing, central India is facing a lot of droughts and floods. So we need stress tolerant varieties. We need uh, we need to, uh, to, to uh, fill the yield gaps, productivity gaps, and then we, we need to talk about the seed, effective seed replacement, effective varietal replacement to get the, uh, the desired productivity. And then when we talk about the resource use efficiency, we need work on the cropping systems. We need to work on the commodity ecosystem as a whole. We need to talk about the uh, effective nutrient management. We need to talk about the improved uh, input use efficiency. And then now we are focusing more on improving the water use efficiency uh, through use of micro irrigation. We have been expanding the area under micro irrigation, which could be very effective in terms of uh, optimizing our uh, water use efficiency. Apart from those, we could have uh, management options like uh, uh, we have now started using drones for precision farming, and those, those drones and advanced technologies could be actually useful for uh, precision in uh, rice cultivation, and then we can uh, uh, optimize on water uh, resource use efficiency. Crop insurance, government of India started a mega sc scheme on Pradhan Mantri uh, risk uh, uh, Fasal B Biology, which is called as crop insurance scheme. So, so that scheme is widely implemented across the country. That could be one of the management options for minimizing the uh, productivity risk in rice and then productive uh, production variability in rice. And then apart from those management options like market intelligence, as we are one of the largest, one of the largest. One of the largest players in rice uh, exports, global rice exports, market intelligence uh, at the national level and at the global level, it could be very effective in terms of uh, improved rice cultivation. And then we have options like uh, uh, system of rice intensification. We have direct seeded rice. We have alternate wet and drying. These technologies have actually proven to be very effective in Eastern and Central states. These are uh, these tend to improve the water productivity. Uh, they, they need to improve the physical productivity and water use efficiency. So these could be the management options for it. These are the technological options for improving uh, sustainable rice cultivation in India. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Raka. That was a very interesting presentation and something obviously is um, extremely useful to look at a more of a global approach and how India can address sustainable rice production. So uh, please, uh, in the audience, please type your Q&A questions uh, in the chat box and we'll come back to them at the end of the presentation. Um, so we'll just move on to our next speaker. I'd like to introduce Dr. Kati Mathswaran is a researcher at the International 
Water Management Institute. He has 11 years of experience of research and work experience applying remote sensing and hydrological modeling tools for sustainable water resources management in Asia and Africa. He has a wide range of experience in applying modeling tools and remote sensing based data sets for improved decision making, including developing participatory web based tools for supporting long term water resources management remote sensing based data simulation for estimating crop water use and data scarce environment, developing gender equality monitoring platform for lower Mekong region and developing a web based seasonal river course change monitoring platform for Myanmar using Google Earth Engine. So today's presentation uh, is on characterizing water productivity of rice systems in Sri Lanka using remote sensing. So over to you, Dr. Kati. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Hussain, and uh, good morning from Sri Lanka. And it's a pleasure to be virtually meeting you all online. And I was there in Philippines for the 2018 ADB Water Conference, and I'm also pleasure to be here again. Um, I'm Kartike and Mateshwaran, researcher on water productivity at the International Water Management Institute based in Sri Lanka. And I've approached my co authors for this study with Mohammed Hassan, Lal Mutweta, and Lisa Maria Revelu all are associated with International Water Management Institute in uh, Sri Lanka. Um, agricultural in South Asia is at a crossroads, facing several challenges that threaten long-term sustainability. And overuse of water is definitely one among them. And despite using intensive resources, the agricultural sector is beset by low productivity and income. So raising the productivity of the agricultural sector is critical to address the interconnected food, nutrient, water security challenges to ensure a sustainable and resilient future. However, the efforts to address low productivity, either it could be a land productivity or water productivity, through upscaling proven technological interventions or policy options are limited, mainly due to the limited availability of data at specified scale. Here, we demonstrate that by combining readily available land and water productivity indicators derived from mainly remote sensing data set uh, and combining with the big data analytics platforms. So by combining these intense data sets with the data sets that are available with the stakeholders locally, we are able to characterize the water productivity of the rice systems in Sri Lanka. Um, just to give you a brief background, Paddy is the main staple crop in Sri Lanka, and it is grown in one third of the total cultivated land here. Uh, it not only engages the 1.5 million farmers here, but also their families. So out of the uh, total rice produced, 75% of the production is, comes from the irrigated rice. And usually these uh, rice production were able to meet the 95% of the domestic demand. However, most of you have uh, come across the recent economic and political turmoil in Sri Lanka in the news, which has severely affected the rice production and endangered the food security of large sections of the population. Um, at the moment, the things are improving. There are renewed thrusts to ensure that the productivity of rice systems in Sri Lanka are optimal to enough to meet the domestic demand. So what will happen in the short term is that this will entail increase in the land productivity in the short term, where the thrust is on maintaining or sustaining the agricultural productions like the previous years. But in the long term, the focus will be on closing the land and water productivity gaps to ensure that the sustenance of food and uh, water security is continued. Um, the water productivity has history of more than two decades. But despite its long history and number of scientific papers and reports, the challenges remain on estimating and using mainly the water productivity at multiple scales. Um, I will just describe in detail what are the main issues and challenges related to using water productivity, uh, particularly in the developing country context. While water productivity uh, has been extensively studied, it remains still poor, poorly understood among many stakeholders. And often water product productivity is referred as an output from the farm to an amount of water used. But sometimes it is easily confused with the water use efficiency, where it is how efficiently we are using at a farm scale or at a different scale. And most of the time, the uh, departments or the stakeholders focus on the traditional aspects, such as maintaining or sustaining are achieving a certain target level of agricultural product, production of cereals and vegetables and other crops. And so because of this, water productivity is comparatively a low priority in the policy hierarchy. And there are reasons for that. Unlike the 
rainfall data, discharge data, or the yield statistics, the water productivity data are not readily available, and neither is it the readily measurable. So most often what you have are the studies focusing on specific areas for specific crops at a farm level, or sometimes you have studies focusing on certain river basins or certain irrigation schemes. So such focus on narrow geographical area limits its applicability for upscaling the potential interventions that will likely come out of that study. And so what happens is that water productivity estimates covering large spatial temporal scale, for example, country or provincial scale, even continental scale, are still extremely complex to calculate for most of the stakeholders. And even if it's available, it is not available at a scale that's meaningful to the stakeholders. However, the things are changing. The portals leveraging the big data sets, uh, you mainly using the earth observation technologies and data analytics, like for example, the VAPO databases are changing the landscapes in terms of the water, in terms of the data availability related to water productivity. So this, uh, the, the, the publicly available databases go some extent to addressing the challenges associated with what data is available out there by, for the stakeholders who can use it to tailor made uh, some interventions. Um, the VAPA portal in Sri Lanka, so this portal is designed by the FAO, United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, in a consortium with a number of partner organizations, and EMI is one among them. And this portal generally provides a land and water productivity indicators. When I say land and water productivity indicators, the primary two indicators that this portal provides is the crop water use and the um, biomass, which can be directly converted into a yield. And for Sri Lanka, this is available covering whole of Sri Lanka at 100 meter spatial resolution. For every 100 meter by 100 meter pixel size or land area in Sri Lanka, one value is available. Um, the figure to the right uh, just provides you a sort of an uh, scenario like for three years, 2015, 17, and 21, the Crop water use are what we call the evapotranspiration data for whole Sri Lanka from the VAPA portal, where you can not only see the spatial variations, but also the temporal variations. For example, you see compar comparatively in 2017, the evapotranspiration is substantially higher than 2015 and 2021. And you can see that it's substantially lower in 2021 compared to the other two years. So this data set can be readily used for agricultural water management, addressing agricultural water management issues. Uh, so we have all this intent data set. And one more thing is that this VAPO data set is available in near real time. It means that it's available every 10 days. But having this data set is, is good. And, and researchers get excited having all these large data set, but how it is useful for the local stakeholders in Sri Lanka. And that is where combining what is available in these big data platforms and what is available with the stakeholders comes into play where, for example, this uh, the, the, the slide I showed you before, this slide consists of our land cover classes, different crops, different types of land covers. So the stakeholder has some specific information or, for example, where the paddy is being grown generally in Sri Lanka. This can be derived from the land use land cover map of 2018 produced by the Land Use Policy Planning Department of Sri Lanka. So using this data set, we can extract the right specific water and land productivity indicators from the big data platforms. And going beyond that, what we can do is we can tailor make, we can create a processing chain in such a way that this data set is sort of aggregated at a, uh, at a level which is slightly larger than the village level. They call it as Gram and Eladari boundaries or GN boundaries. And these GN boundaries are the lowest administrative level at which most of the agriculture related administration happens. And sometimes even the crop production statistics and crop cutting have been uh, usually happens at this GN level. So uh, the, the stakeholders understand this particular administrative level and using this level also negates some of the challenges associated with using a coarse resolution data where it's, it's not suitable exactly for the farm level applications. Uh, in this particular case, we used the vapor data sets related to land and water productivity and combined with the paddy area from the stakeholders and also the GN boundaries we selected to almost close to 2,062 uh, GN boundaries across six provinces, which are shown in the um, yellow color. And the one in the green color are basically the paddy areas uh, within these boundaries. So we were able to convert whatever that's available at a pixel level in terms of this big data analytics platform to a uh, level that is more meaningful for the stakeholders. And in terms of the overall approach, 
So we just took the two main data set, that is crop water use and the net primary production, which can be converted into yield. And then we calculated the crop water productivity, which is basically the ratio of yield to the amount of water used. And then we extracted the paddy area and the GN boundaries to derive paddy specific water productivity and then aggregate it at the GN level. Um, this is sort of an intermediate uh, uh, sort of results that come out of the study where you could see that the changes in the crop water use, particularly for the paddy areas within Sri Lanka. And you can see this is specifically for the Maha season, which is the main agricultural season in Sri Lanka, which goes from September, October to February, March every year. So within that particular span, we were able to aggregate how much water is being used by, uh, by the paddy, uh, paddy systems, particularly in the dry, dry zone of Sri Lanka. And we were able to convert these into an estimate that can be readily uh, understood by the stakeholders. For example, the total crop water use for paddy in the season varies from 1.5 kilometer cube by 2.5 kilometer cube. Uh, you can see that's like an year on or season on variation is like more than one kilometer cube. That is quite quite substantial. So there is really a scope to implement interventions where the water productivity could be substantially increased. Yeah, and, and as I said, we can convert this into a GN level applications. And what you can see here are that at the GN level, you have like two or three clusters where one cluster is having lower water productivity and the other cluster is having higher water productivity. And most importantly, water productivity is not static. So potentially an interventions can be designed to address these particular divisions where lower water productivity was of rice has been mapped. Um, just to sum it up, uh, combining what, uh, water productivity data from uh, big platforms with in-country data uh, not only provides some meaningful information, it also ensures the confidence in the analysis and the data because the stakeholders also has a say in what the type of analysis we are doing. And the water productivity mapping at, a, at the spatial level of GN is really suitable for the departments, local departments and the policymakers because they can target improvements at this level because you have staffs available at this particular administrative boundaries. And you can also see potential to reduce spatial variability uh, can be seen among the different uh, GN divisions. So once you address this spatial variability of this water productivity, that will substantially improve the water and food security. And uh, so basically using these, you can also identify the causes uh, of these low water productivity in these GN divisions and then uh, design suitable interventions so that the overall productivity contributes to the overall food security of the country. So, but then most importantly, the water productivity targets alone are not, not, sub, uh, not sufficient because it has to accompany it by a substantial gains for the farmers because for the farmers, water productivity doesn't mean anything at the farm level. So unless they, they are under water scarce scenario. So the water productivity has to be accompanied by some sort of a gains, whether in terms of uh, uh, productivity increase or less labor or some sort of monetary or gain or some sort of an advantage for the farmers. In addition to that, there needs to be a continued capacity building programs. And that is one key to mainstreaming water productivity. In this case, we have conducted more than 10 capacity building programs in the past one year, covering number of departments in Sri Lanka. Uh, so we are just extending this analysis to different, uh, the whole covering whole of Sri Lanka, and then tailoring different applications using these data sets, and then looking at the productivity of major and minor irrigation schemes. And uh, thanks a lot for the uh, chance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Karthi. That was a very good presentation and a great example of using big data and uh, filling in those gaps in uh, detailed data from countries. So we'll just move on to the next uh, presenter. And again, just reminding people, please enter your questions into the Q&A box so that we can uh, ask these at the end of the presentations. So I'd just like to introduce Mr. Ashwani Kumar Apanya. You, a retired chief engineer and project director of the Mohanpura Kondalia Project Management Unit in Madhya Pradesh Water Resources Department. So Mr. Kumar uh, started his career as a civil engineer in the Water Resources Department in 1983. He has been an undersecretary for five years and also a superintending engineer at the HA. He has extensive experience in obtaining sanctions and funding for numerous minor medium and major irrigation projects under India's Accelerated Irrigation Benefit Program. He has also been the project director and chief engineer of the Mohanpura 
Condalia Project Management Unit. And today he is presenting on the Smart Precision Agri Irrigation System of Condalia Left Bank and Right Bank Lift Irrigation Scheme in Madhya Pradesh. So over to you, Mr. Ashwani. Good morning. Thanks, Susan. And thank ADB to giving me this platform to share some experience uh, which I had earned in the fake end of my service period regarding micro irrigation and smart irrigation systems. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all based where you have joined from this forum. This is my presentation based on my experience as project director of Kundalia project, a project I have been associated with till recently. ADB has supported this project and continues to do so. Briefly about Kundalia irrigation project, the source of water of Kund is Kundalia Dam that is built on Kalisind River on the borders of districts of Rajgarh and Agar in Madhya Pradesh, state of India. It is a storage of 582 million cubic meters. Dam was completed in a record time of less than three years and was funded by government of Madhya Pradesh. ADB is supporting the development of irrigation services to more than 130,000 hectares of farms spread over 354 villages. Now, increasing the economic value of water, this, this itself is quite fizzy in India and particularly in MP's agriculture scenario, where 70% of the population is dependent on agriculture. However, this project attempts to do it through leveraging the private sector expertise so that investment costs are optimized in terms of service standards and technical standards. In this project, FedEx Gold Book for Design, Operate and Build has been used. In addition to DBO contractors, their subcontractors are also required to pre-qualify. This project is named as Madhya Pradesh Irrigation Efficiency Improvement Project, and its main goal is to improve upon the prevalent project efficiencies of irrigation project, which are mostly about 48 to 52 percent to about 80 percent with the use of pressurized pipe irrigation delivery. All water deliveries in terms of pressure and quantity are measured through SCADA system. Minimum 20 meter water column or two bar pressure at field level has been ensured so that micro irrigation can be adopted. Water quality suitable for micro irrigation is assured with two stage filtration. First at pump station with filter filtration about 200 microns and next at 30 hectare outlet management system level for 150 microns. Adoption of variable frequency drives, VFDs, at pump station, optimization and decision support system with SCADA is another feature that this project for optimized operations. These are some performance guarantees which has been put in the contract, which contractor has to achieve in their uh, operation and maintenance period that is for five years. You can go through it, it has how much water is to be delivered, what is the leakage, what is the maximum power consumption, SCADA requirement. These all things are the conditions which they have to follow. Implementation and operation support. And now, right in this scenario, enhanced economic value of water cannot be achieved merely with the innovation on the supply side. Such projects need a major shift in farmers' readiness to adopt advanced agriculture practices like sprinklers, drapes, right seeds, fertigation, farm equipments, etc. The project is attempting to take up these aspects in its operation and maintenance period through farmer field schools of more than 100, uh, 1,250 hectares of farm, encouraging farmers group to collaborate for community agriculture and even form farmer producer organizations to leverage market opportunities. <clears throat> SCADA is a common feature nowadays in pressurized irrigation system throughout the world. In this system, in this project, we have attempted to use data from SCADA for decision support so that the system can be optimized while operating. It will be better, in, it will give a better information for irrigation managers as well as for farmers so that they know when and how much to irrigate. Now, this slide is about the features of DSS, various variable effects, the right irrigation scheduling, namely 
we can say that the weather that is precipitation wind etc the soil type texture water holding capacity soil moisture the crop type and its stage as planted by the farmer the area and acreage in which it is planted and the irrigation infrastructure itself all these variables should theoretically decide the irrigation schedule but weather itself changes on a day to day basis so we have a flexible scheduling system in the project like other projects it is capable to handle a fixed or predefined irrigation scheduling system running on a autopilot mode or a customized one as predefined by the water users association water users themselves and one that is dynamic and based on a daily remote sensing thermal products telling the exact crop water requirement on that day we will discuss this on a later which has come out from a study specially supported by adb through eri watch of netherlands all of this would be bundled in the farmers app in this slide on the right side of the slide is how we have designed this farmers app things appear in english here but final product is going to be in hindi this is still a work in progress as we are add more informational features yet keep the farmers interface simple as was mentioned a while back in my previous slide we are also attempting to integrate remote sensing information from satellite imageries into dss and farmers app this took off with a small study thanks to adb a study done by eri watch of netherlands led by dr wim on your left side you can see one of the study areas i think it is pilwas village as much in agar district as far as as i recall which is a 30 hectare cluster of farms different colors pertain to different times and a reddish color representing hot crop that is requiring irrigation green a colder state meaning no irrigation is required on the right are pictures of the ground validation exercises carried out using tensiometers soil classification etc for calibrating the remote sensing interpretations i have very little knowledge on this aspect but we really liked what we so the plan now is to scale it up to entire kundalia command i again thank adb for such a wonderful study here we have some photographs we have uh, in in kundalia project we have two our right bank canal system and a left bank canal system each is catering almost uh, 67000 hectares of uh, area so in we have six bladder vessels in rbc and three bladder vessels in lbc i have included these photographs only to familiarize those who have not seen them because i was also in a similar situation 5 6 years back here i would like to conclude that presentation with these words that enhancing the economic value of irrigation water requires to have a good quality and serviceable infrastructure that is efficient in water use and in energy use while balancing the supply with the demand in near real time through smart decisions based on actual data so that to meet the aspirations of our farmers so that they can adopt high performance irrigation and agricultural practices without requiring additional on farm energy with this i conclude my uh, presentation thanks suzan for giving me the chance thank you very much mr ashwani that was an excellent example of how to adopt uh real time data scada systems and bringing it down to the farmer level i think that's a very good example that could be adopted in numerous cases i uh, hope some people have some questions for mr ashwani at the end of this presentation so thank you uh we'll show move on to the next uh speaker but again please do write your questions in the Q&A session we have uh, a few there at the moment but I'd like to see a few more questions so we can ask our speakers at the end thank you mr shwani so moving on to our next speaker we have dr lee baumgarter he's an interim director at the gowali institute of charles Sturt university 
Professor Baumgartner designs, supervises, and undertakes research into various aspects of the biology and ecology of freshwater fish and systems. He has an interest in fish passage and fish migration and the impact of human disturbance on aquatic ecosystems, developing solutions to global challenges in water resources management and the connections between peoples and inland fish. Recently, has developed a series of short courses which aim to help organisations build capacity in specific areas of water management. He has main ge uh, geographic areas of expertise in southeastern Australia, the Murray Darling Basin, and the Lower Mekong, but also has active collaborations in South Africa, Europe, and North America and Indonesia. So I shall hand over to Dr. Lee, please, uh, your presentation. Thank you. You were just on mute there. Mute. The unmute button is there. So thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and uh, thank you to everyone who's, who's Zoomed in today. Uh, I guess my talk is a little bit about uh, how we are going about working in productive rice-based systems, but also trying to ensure that uh, when the river infrastructure is put in place to support those rice-based systems, that we're also making sure that we get benefits to other areas. Um, and specifically, I'll talk about maintaining productive fisheries within rice systems today. So I guess I'll start my presentation by saying in Southeast Asia, both fish and rice production systems are very important. So we Fisheries are consumed, particularly in the lower Mekong Basin, uh, are consumed very widely. That on average, 60 kilograms of fish per year is consumed per person. It is one of the most important sources of protein and micronutrients for, for people who are living in the, the region. But rice is also very important. It's very important for economic terms. It's important for, as food security. And uh, quite often we find that in some areas where systems are developed for rice, they're not so good for fish. Uh, if we look at areas around the world where dams are still being constructed, there's still very, very strong area in Southeast Asia where there are new dams being built. And it's not only large dams that are being built, it's also smaller irrigation structures. And the map that I have here on the screen is actually a picture of uh, the state of of low head structures, this is less than six metres high, uh, across the lower Mekong Basin. And th this map is now a few years old, so there's actually a lot more structures which are known throughout the region. But we're, we're more and more uh, in terms of water security and providing water for productive use, uh, changing the way that our rivers flow in the region. And so the work that we do, um, some of the examples there is whether it's road crossings or block banks or culverts or bridges or dams, uh, we know that these do impact fish in some areas. And in some areas, we've seen uh, some fairly significant declines in fisheries productivity after these structures have been built. So the work that we do is trying to make sure that rice fish systems stay productive. The reason that that the rice fish systems are productive is because there's a very good flow of nutrients between the systems. Uh, when rivers are connecting with floodplains, uh, there's a nice exchange of nutrients there, but it's also very good for, for fish growth and fish production. They're very productive areas and, and people catch a lot of fish in these areas. The, the rice fields are also productive because they're on the floodplain and there's lots of nutrients there. So, um, so we're seeing dual benefits where floodplains are developed for rice. There's there's good fisheries within the rice systems. Um, where they're still natural, we see very good fisheries and people's livelihoods are supported by those fisheries. So, so our work is recognising this interface between rice fish systems and the importance of connectivity. So we, we look, take this from a very pragmatic view and we say it's very possible to have fish and rice in these modified landscapes. There's lots of different ways that you can transform a, a rice fish landscape to create better outcomes for fish. The work that we particularly focus on is through the construction of fish ladders. And that, that is a way, that is a channel around these systems that enables fish to, to enter areas where they cannot access because of regulators and dams and weirs. And, um, but what we try and do is make sure that we're having both rice production and fisheries and so that neither particular sector is influenced by the other. 
the work we do is about coming up with technical solutions to try and get win-win outcomes for rice and fish. And, and this slide here shows a few examples of how that can happen. And most of the examples that you can see on this slide are really about applying technical solutions that allow fish to move freely between the areas they need to move in order for them to grow and survive and then become uh, food for people who catch them. So uh, in order to maintain that connectivity between the systems, uh, we build things like sustainable sluice gates, regulators, sustainable culverts, a whole range of different uh, solutions that can help fish to, to move between them. The reason we thought that it might be of relevance to this particular forum is because we've been working with some of the donor banks and, and trying to help improve the sustainability of some of their projects. Um, these are some examples here uh, from some work that was done by the World Bank in southern Laos. These were some regulators which, which were constructed uh, many years ago, which had fallen into a state of disrepair and were deemed as important to rehabilitate as part of investment programs. So the work that we did is that we walked in and we we worked with the local engineers and the local provincial and district people to try and come up with designs that would maintain the water security that these were aiming to achieve, but also to make sure that they supported productive fisheries as well. And these are just a few photos. I'll just flip through here some transition photos to show how just with some simple modifications to the, the final designs, we've actually been able to have dual outcomes here. These structures actually provide for fish and also maintain their water security outcomes as well. So um, that's just some, some simple areas there where, where we show some different technical solutions that can actually help. Uh, we've also, in, in some instances, there's been uh, the technical design teams that have been implementing the projects actually haven't, they've understood that there's been a need to provide for fish and they've tried to construct fish ladders, but didn't have necessarily the technical knowledge to do this or did not have access to data on the local fish to do this effectively. Now, this is an example here of a, a structure in northern Laos, which we were asked to inspect. Um, the fishway, the, there was an attempt at a fishway which didn't work so well because of the design. So we actually worked with the design engineers to, uh, to come up with a different solution, um, which created better outcomes for fish. There's another, another example here of some initial planning we're doing with the Asia Development Bank on some work uh, which is just starting up. Uh, there's three priority structures which have been identified as requiring replacement and refurbishment. And uh, we've been working with the design engineers to incorporate better fish ladder designs into these to ensure that the fish aren't impacted by these rehabilitation programs and that people are able to benefit uh, as well as the rice production. So these are the small scale irrigation projects which are now being developed for both fish and rice outcomes. And um, I'll just say, this is my final slide here, just showing some of the improved fisheries that we are seeing at, at many of these sites. Uh, we are actually seeing fish return in, in, in big numbers, so hundreds of kilograms per day in some areas. We're hearing fishermen talk about catching fish that they haven't been able to catch uh, in decades at some of these sites. So not only are we seeing the benefits in terms of rice production, we're also seeing that the fishermen are starting to be happy and start to report better outcomes as well. Uh, we've also developed a decision support tool that accompanies this work, which can help designers determine the relative cost of the fishway versus the expected benefits in terms of increased fisheries yield. So we can actually help to make some economic decisions as well through that. So um, so that was just a little bit of a practical example there of some, some initiatives we're implementing across Southeast Asia. So thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Lee. That was a great presentation and yeah, very interesting on how to get dual benefits from irrigation with fisheries and also looking at the retrofitting some of the existing schemes around the world, I'm sure is a good challenge, um, but nonetheless a very important one. So thank you for your presentation. And we're now just going to move over to a, a question and answer session. So we have some questions coming in from the audience and I'd just like to read some of them out. Um, some are directed at some of our speakers. So I'll just ask you to um, answer those ones as I bring them up. So for, um, for Dr. Aker, um, a question from Yella is, is micro irrigation feasible for rice? So maybe Dr. Aker, you'd like to answer that one. Uh, 
yes uh, micro irrigation is actually effective for rice as well uh, but uh, in, in india it has been basically uh, implemented in a scale for more for horticulture commodities like we have vegetables and some other crops but it's effective for rice as well the studies have reported that it leads to enhancement in productivity and the resource use efficiency when we when we implement micro irrigation for rice as well as in india yeah and government of india is giving huge emphasis on expanding the micro uh, irrigation uh, almost on an average every year we are adding 1 million hectare area under micro irrigation in the country so we are making huge progress uh, on that account great thank you very much for that answering that question there we have um the next question uh is regarding in the areas of, from john colinhay uh, in the areas that are now, now less suitable for rice production, how do you engage with landholders there to find alternatives? So also, I think this could be directed to you, Dr. Aker, but could also be to some other, other panelists as well. But we'll start with you, Dr. Aker. Uh, could you please repeat the question? Sure. In the areas that are now less suitable for rice production, how do you engage with the landholders there to find alternatives? Yeah. So uh, when we talk, talk about switching uh, in terms of uh, rice cultivation to alternative pockets, we actually need the capacity building of farmers. And we need to tell them that what could be the right alternatives, optimum alternatives for uh, switching the rice cultivation in the country. And we have very strong uh, network of extension functionaries in the country. We have a farmers knowledge center, which we call that as Krishi Vigyan Kendras. And we have these, all these Krishi Vigyan Kendra's farmers knowledge centers in every district in the country. Apart from that, we have many other extension initiatives and we could, then, we could engage them more effectively in terms of uh, making the farmers aware about the uh, improved uh, and alternative mechanisms for uh, shifting to rice cultivation in the country. They are actually cultivating. But, but you know, we need to provide them facilitating environment in, term, in terms of uh, assured irrigation, in terms of uh, price support, in, in terms of other policy uh, facilitation, in terms of infrastructure. So, so a facilitating environment in terms of improved technology, policy, and institutions would be actually beneficial for the uh, small landholders in the country. Great. Thanks, Dr. Rika. Is there any other um, panelists who would like to chip in on that? Question. Okay, we'll move to the next one. Uh, another question, well, actually it's more of a statement from Yella from ADB. He's saying it's great to see how the pilot is leaping to expansion in a fully fledged app. So I believe this is towards Mr. Ishwan um, and the farmer app that's been developed. Perhaps you can just give a, a short uh, little description on how that app is going. Um, at the farmer level? Right now, the project is under construction stage. It is uh, partially complete uh, with the uh, delivery up to 30 hectares. We are targeting it to be completed by next June. And by that time, this app will be active because it is in process of building. That's great. Uh, yeah, but we are very thankful to ADB to uh, because the study through ERI Watch, what we are getting is very helpful. And uh, we have decided uh, to go to the total command of 130,000 hectares instead of only 1,250 or 30 hectares. Fantastic. Yes, I think it's something that um, would be very good for a number of other projects to come and view the app once it's up and running and see if they can adopt a similar approach. He has uh, shifted to almost uh, 3 uh, million hectare in micro irrigation and uh, they will become, these projects will be completed in the next five years. Fantastic. That's really good to hear. So we'll just move to the next question and it is how to value the virtual water in international trade or it's a already available, do share some insights from the panel speakers. So the virtual water, virtual water and international trade, or it's already available to share some um, insights from the panel speakers. So perhaps we'll have someone, uh, any other speakers like to 
discuss against that one. Uh, yes, uh, virtual water trade is, is it's a global uh, phenomenon. In all the global economies, they are giving due emphasis on uh, finding different approaches to, to measure the virtual water trade. Uh, so different countries they have they have uh, they have uh, estimated the virtual water coefficients and seeing how these water flows across uh, the countries they they exist and how the water flows are happening. But uh, you know what what is the limitation in terms of virtual water trade when we talk about the virtual water trade flows? We have virtual water coefficient for different commodities. And virtual water trade coefficients are, are, I mean, this is a dynamic phenomenon and we have, we have when we have climate change and many other uh, climatic uh, phenomenon happening, the virtual water trade coefficient must change. But we are, the studies on virtual water trade, they are actually, they are actually confining themselves to the, to the coefficients developed earlier by, by uh, researchers like we have Chepagin, Hoekstra. These are the pioneers in terms of virtual water uh, trade coefficients. So I think the time has come that, you know, we must revisit these water coefficients uh, across the globe. And in terms of, you know, the major trading countries must actually revisit these coefficients so that we can have much more precise estimates in terms of virtual water trade uh, across the countries. Great, thank you. Reka on answering that question. So we have a, a question directed to Dr. Lee, and this is, is there any coordination with the Tat Lung Marsh, Marsh Fish Passage work of the ADB? Perhaps you may be familiar with that. Yes, absolutely. Um, we're, we're very involved in that particular body of work. Construction's underway on a, on a, on a fish ladder there in Vientiane and uh, hopefully will be completed by the end of the year. So, so it's a pretty exciting project. Great. So you're providing design support for that particular project? Absolutely. Yes. Great. Uh, I guess, is there any particular challenges you're seeing in that project or uh, so wins? It's been a really difficult, I guess the main challenge has been designing a fishway in the middle of COVID when you haven't been able to access the site. So it's been quite a challenge um, liaising between the, the team that's on the ground versus the design team. But uh, but now that travel restrictions have eased, uh, we've been able to get back. So I, I would say designing fish ladders in pandemic has been a significant challenge. Yes, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, nothing like getting to the field and actually seeing it in real life. Oh, great. Good to hear. Um, so I have another question here from Ravindra Malak in New Delhi. So I'll just read this out as it's written. Uh, Trying to improve economic value of water without concurrently bringing in the mainstream analysis, the agricultural policies, marketing infrastructure, crop procurement systems, etc., which determine the use of water by farmers is unlikely to take us much farther and sustain in the long run and if it's made in improving economic value of water. So I think this is, again, maybe um, directed a bit to uh, Dr. Raka on that one. Yeah, this is actually really uh, this is actually extremely important. And I said uh, during the last of my presentation, when we talk about uh, redesigning a different kind of crop geometry in the country in terms of rice cultivation, uh, what we uh, uh, what we uh, what we do uh, because you know I, I said that you know we need to have uh, the uh, amalgamation of technology options. We need to have a proper amalgamation of policy facilitation, and then we need to have proper amalgamation of institutions in terms of infrastructure. Like he has already uh, mentioned that we need, we have uh, price support policies, we have marketing support policies, we have marketing infrastructure fund, and all these things will support, uh, only then we would be able to have switch over to a different kind of crop geometry in the country. So it's extremely important, extremely important. Great, thank you. Uh, Susan, if I may add um, sure. to the question uh, from uh, Dr. Ravin Malik, uh, this is Karthi. Uh, so that's one of the key findings from our study too, in the sense that uh, unless and otherwise there are substantial improvements for the farmers in terms of either the benefits that occur from the farm, whether improvements in yield or improvements in the amount of money they earn from the farms, uh, the, the water productivity itself or the economic value of water doesn't mean anything for the farmer as such. It means different things for the policymakers, but at the farm level, particularly for the farmers, it, they, they, they don't 
because you take India where we provide subsidies to electricity, okay, and and also this the basically the water is generally provided for free, so it is very difficult to convince them that the economic value of water. Um, so so it has to be accompanied by some measures. For example, we piloted an irrigation schedule tools not in Sri Lanka but in Africa where the improvements were on both water productivity and land productivity. So the farmers were able to see improvements in yield. And as a byproduct of it, there was improvement in water productivity. So it has to be hand in hand. Uh, it has to go hand in hand and just improvement in water productivity alone, uh, particularly in the context of South Asia and, and particularly in, in Sri Lankan case, it doesn't go much actually. Thank you. No, thank you. No, that's a very good point. And I'm um, building that, fleshing that out. Great, we'll come back to you, um, Katia. I think I have some other questions for you coming up. Uh, just one for Dr. Lee. Uh, what are the most challenges for designing the infrastructure and how can we engage with the government? So this is from uh, from Hong Ha, the reporter, for the session. Uh, the, the main challenges that we have are, are the technical challenges and making sure that we do it do this correctly. So uh, a lot of the engagement we have is at various levels of government. So firstly, we would engage at the district level to make sure that the solution is fit for the local communities and people. Then we would work with the provincial level to make sure it's consistent with development plans in the region. But we'd also work with the federal government to make sure that it's in line with uh, the various sort of environmental safeguards and, and irrigation policies. So it's very important to engage at all levels of government, uh, but also very very important to engage at the village level because that's where most of the beneficiaries are. Yes, great. And so, yeah, um, so yeah, engaging with the government and also the farmers to implement the project is it? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's always a bit of a challenge at that level. Um, also, about retrofitting um, dams, etc. Is there a lot of resistance um, looking at, it or is it more? Um, it's like from the, the governments or the farmers? It's mo it, when you retrofit a fish ladder to an existing site, it's always more expensive than if you do it at a greenfield site or at a site that's always working. So, um, so we usually find that most of the resistance is in terms of cost and so then it becomes a compromise exercise to try and make sure that we get a solution that works according to the available budget. However, it's, it's much easier to, to get a good solution for fish and rice if, if we have irrigation and fisheries people engaged from the design phase of the project. So, so we try and make sure everyone's talking together as early as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Getting that up front and done is much easier, uh, particularly if the infrastructure can be modified prior. So um, those are the last questions that we have um, from the audience. So I'll just have a few other questions, but um, please, if the audience has any other questions, please post them so that we can ask our speakers. Um, for Dr. Carty, um, so have you got examples of this, um, of the portal being used by governments at the moment or practical examples that are currently being uptaking or the government willingness for taking this uh, on? At the moment, we are discussing the different departments in, in Sri Lanka. For example, the irrigation department, we have been uh, collaborating with them quite closely and we trained the young engineers for like close to like, we organized like seven to 10, um, 10 capacity building programs mainly to just how to access these portals and then download the data set and convert it into forms that is meaningful for them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we have been doing. And we also have been engaging with, for example, the Sustainable Development Council, who could potentially use this data set for reporting on the SDG 6.4.1 uh, indicator. And we are also looking uh, at discussing with the Rice Research Institute in Sri Lanka and also the Department of Agriculture in Sri Lanka to basically, because at the moment it's, it's like a diagnostic analysis where we primarily use the remote sensing. And we are uh, trying to combine it with the knowledge of the stakeholders in the sense, what are the specific rice varieties grown in different parts of the um, parts of the Sri Lanka? And if you look at it, although they call it as a dry zone, the, the, what, what the, the water scarcity problem is mainly for growing the second crop of rice and not for the main crop. Um, so that's that's the main problem there. Uh, unlike in other places where the, 
the water scarcity is for that particular irrigation season. So we are just looking at extending the analysis to the second season and also extending the analysis to different parts and, and then basically just tying this remote sensing analysis with the, the knowledge of the stakeholders uh, from, from the different regions. For example, the irrigation engineers who work with the farmers uh, at the, the Rice Research Institute who has extensive experience and done field experiments, whether, for example, the biomass and yield estimates that derive from the remote sensing data is meaningful at the moment. At the moment, since we haven't validated it, it's, it's, it's mm. completely useful to do a sort of a cross comparison between, okay, this is the difference between this and this is, is this much, but we are not yet comparing the absolute values of water productivity, and that needs further validation of this data set, and that's, that's what we are, we are in the process of doing at the moment. And the hope is to have like some sort of a consent from the government agencies to use this data set for, for either the SDG reporting or assessing irrigation performance of the major or minor irrigation systems in Sri Lanka. And, and we are hoping to do it for, for a few, at least few major irrigation schemes in Sri Lanka at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. A really great tool as well for project officers at ADB and other development institutions to be aware of so that they can, um, well, it helps with any project to uh, direct funding in the right areas. So very good that this presentation has been done on this platform. Um, so I'll just also ask on to, uh, to Mr. Shwani. Um, I just wanted to ask a bit about the successfulness of the design build operate modality, uh, encouraging contractors to, to build quality and efficient irrigation systems. Um, has there been challenges or what benefits have you seen from that? So Mr. Ashwani. Yeah, in, uh, we have started uh, almost four years back uh, with this uh, model, design, build, and operate. Uh, initially, we had uh, challenges regarding that the quality of design or the rigidness of the uh, seniors who had a different thought of mind regarding uh, the planning of irrigation with open canals. And just to switch on pipe irrigation, it was a very challenging thing itself for the officers. Mm. Whereas to, it is ma much more challenging to farmers. So initially we had to come out with a uh, concept, with demo and all these things that this system will work in this way. And instead of running on department, because department will not be able to operate and maintain it after the completion period. So it is better to go on Fiddy Gold Book uh, design build operation. Now it is successfully uh, running in almost uh, 43 projects. That's that's excellent. Yeah, no, no, good to hear. I think it's um something that can also be shared amongst the other states to understand the DBO modality and see if it can be uptaked because there is obviously some great benefits, but yeah, challenges for government departments to uptake that type. Um, and also just the uptake of the micro irrigation by the farmers. Uh, was there quite a lot of willingness there or are the challenges for them to um, take that on? Uh, definitely the, there is a challenge because it is a uh, total shift of uh, nature of irrigation, which has come from generations with the open canal system. So until unless the water reaches in their farm, till that day, they are reluctant to believe that pressurized pipe irrigation will give them water. But we have successfully completed one 25,600 hectare area of Mohanpura project. We have made that area as a demo for the all commands and nearby project commands so that they can work, come there, seed there. And in the meantime, we have developed uh, demo farms in Kundalia itself also. So now they, uh, they are seeing and they are believing. It's good to hear. And I think, yeah. Uh, but it will, it will take almost four or five years to go to completely 80, 85% switch on to micro irrigation. Yeah. So it's a, it's a long, long project, but with um, very much e excellent gains. Uh, so I hope uh, some of our other projects around India can see the sort of progress that your project has made. Uh, thank you for that. And I'll just go to Dr. Uh, back to Dr. Reka, um, just about um, how you're talking about groundwater extraction um, being one of you know the big challenges there. Um, does your um, does it also take into the monitoring and regulation of this groundwater extraction into your uh, viewing the water trade? 
sorry, can you please repeat the question? So in, in your um, viewing the water trade, you talk about looking at the groundwater extraction and areas that are over extracted. Uh, does that also take into the monitoring and regulation of that or, you know, is that a solution or a, something that needs to be included or looked at in the management? Uh, yeah, so when we talk about uh, this rice, in most of the areas, this rice is uh, largely irrigated with the groundwater. So we have taken into consideration the groundwater extraction as one of the major parameters that which are the critical regions in terms of groundwater exploitation. And rightly said that uh, monitoring and uh, evaluation of uh, groundwater extraction is very important when we talk about effective use of groundwater in the country. So we have now uh, this, uh, you know, tensium metal like uh, 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 Mr. Ashwini has talked about, and then uh, we our uh, friend from uh, Sri Lanka has also talked about uh, the effective mechanisms which could lead to water use efficiency. So we have devices, we have mechanisms which can lead to uh, proper monitoring and evaluation of groundwater use in terms of rice cultivation. So these are actually very, very important. Great, thank you. We have a few more questions that have come in from the audience. So uh, this one is directed to Dr. Lee. Uh, how does the Fish Passage Masterclass design process help the stakeholder participation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yes, we, we developed a, a sort of two-level masterclass. We've got a, a masterclass which is aimed at helping sort of mid-level irrigation and, and fisheries engineers and practitioners who are, who are embedded within government, who are involved in the decision-making process. And so the masterclass that we've developed there, um, we generally get equal numbers of fisheries and irrigation staff. We get them together for four days and they sit down, they, they bring to the class a, a structure that they're interested in and we spend four days designing a fish ladder for it. So it's an actual practical hands-on course where everyone gets to design the fish ladder. The, the most practical outcome that I understand is that the, when fisheries people arrive at a at the masterclass, they don't understand a lot about engineering. And when the engineers arrive at the masterclass, they don't understand a lot about fisheries. But by the end of four days, they both understand each other's perspectives really well. So it's a shared learning environment. And so that's that's the one that we target at mid-level. That We also have a, a masterclass that we've run at the village and district level where we actually work with local communities to develop the to develop solutions to problems. And so we sit down with them, they, they bring a problem, we work on that together and we understand that the community aspirations and, and you know, what the impacts have been at, since the structure's been built, how they would like to see fisheries be productive and how important their rice is to them. And so we work through it at the coal face as well. And that's really important at sites where at the end of the project, we may construct a fish ladder and the community assumes ownership of it. They then understand how it works and they understand how to operate it going forward. So that's really important as well, that, that you empower the sort of local communities with the knowledge and skills necessary to, to operate it over the long term. Great. Thanks, Lee. Uh, so we're just going back to Mr. Ashwani. Uh, this is a question from David Ginting. His question is, are you planning to engage the private sector to do the O&M after the design build um, operate period? Yes, uh, there is a provision that uh, we can extend the period with the consent of the uh, contractor who is at present there. If it is not so, then we will be going for the bid for uh, further private operation and maintenance in all such projects. It has been decided by, as, as a government decision. Great. No, that's good Good to hear. <laughs> that's one of the key areas I think uh, ADB likes to focus on is the operation and maintenance and making sure projects are sustainable. And we, we, have just have... Thank you. we are already uh, under preparation of uh, this document for further extending designing and maintenance. Excellent to hear. Thank you, Ms. Shwani. So the last question we have here, uh, what are the biggest challenges in ensuring that available data is translated into evidence-based policy making? So any of the panelists would like to answer that question, please go ahead. Okay, I can take a shot. <laughs> uh, the biggest uh, challenge is basically there is a gulf between um, there is data. One one case there is not enough data available in some cases for the stakeholders. In some cases there are data available, but it's not in a format that's acceptable to the different stakeholders. Uh, 
For example, uh, take the case of Sri Lanka, you have like certain departments which has expertise in GIS and remote sensing, which can readily take these uh, van and water productivity indicators data available in the portal and process it. But there are in the, there are departments like Department of Agriculture where mm -hmm. the capacity is really limited in terms of uh, you know doing this the technical capacity is limited in terms of gis and remote sensing data processing in in, in such cases the impediment is more like in terms of the capacity uh, but uh, we have come across in other countries particularly in africa where it's more to do with the data availability uh, maybe that department has capacity but uh, it doesn't have the uh, it doesn't have access to the to the data that that's needed for them, and also it's not that the same data could be useful for different level of stakeholders. The policymakers would be just needing uh, a different sort of an okay. This is the amount of water used in Sri Lanka, and this is the variation and how we can optimize it, how we can sustainably manage it for the future. Uh, but if you go to the local level, then they would need, for example, at this level, what is the water productivity? And it's even, even in some cases, the water productivity may not be the right, uh, I would say, the indicator for, for example, the extension agents where uh, um, the water productivity doesn't mean a lot to them. For them, it's they were more focused on yield. Um, so so there, there is a need for sustained capacity building programs to make them aware that this is sort of uh, useful in the long run, where it will essentially improve not only the water productivity, but also the water their uh, agricultural production. So yeah, converting the data into a format that's meaningful, and the other one is the data availability to the right departments. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, any other comments from the panelists? I might add from a, from a fish ladder and a fish and, and rice perspective, um, one of the challenges we have is, is that all the different end user groups require data presented to them in a different format. So, so fisheries people are happy to, to get things on fisheries yield and biodiversity. Irrigation engineers like numbers and, and measurements. And, and, uh, and when we're talking to, to particularly to the development banks, they like, data to present it in economic terms and so mm -hmm. effectively we're taking the same data and trying to present it in a range of different ways to suit the target audiences um, because at the end of the day this is about joint decision making yeah great no, excellent points that you're making there making sure that the data is yeah presented in the right way to the right audiences uh to move the line across uh yes Raka. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about this uh, virtual water trade data or any other water resource data, the data must be very dynamic. But uh, in some cases, like I mentioned about this virtual water trade data, we are relying on the old estimates. So the, this database must be really dynamic so that, you know, we were, when, when water resources are, are changing so dynamically across the world, we must really revisit, uh, make efforts to revisit such kind of data so that we get real insights about how these flows are determining across the nations. So that's one of the important things that this should really be a dynamic database. And Karthi has already talked about the capacity of the, the uh, agencies uh, within uh, nations. So it has really, uh, it really needs to be enhanced when we talk about this advanced data, AI, ML, uh, imageries, and also, so this uh, capacity must be really enhanced so that we can translate the uh, uh, satellite data into more uh, useful insights with the use of uh, applications, softwares, and other machine learning approaches. Yeah, thanks. Great, no, thank you, thank you very much. So I think at this point we'll end our Q&A session. I, we've had some very good questions and thank you to the panelists for answering those. I would just like to summarize uh, the session's key messages for today. Um, the speakers today have provided several examples how, of how we can improve the productivity and economic use of water in the face of dwindling resources. So we have a common th theme through all these speakers' presentations is to making use of technology and data uh, to increase the productivity of water and agriculture. We've had examples of um, remote sensing, decision support systems, balancing demand with supply, reliable data, and utilizing technological solutions uh, for sustainable rice cultivation as well as fisheries and getting that uh, dual benefit there. So I'd really like to thank all the speakers today. Uh, your insights have been really informative and hopefully it's sparking a bit of interest in our audience. And I'd also like to thank our um, a reporter today, Young Water Professional Hong Ha, and I also encourage 
all of the audience to attend the other sessions of the Water Forum and to visit the platform and see the other examples there. So thank you once again. This has been a great session and we look forward to seeing you in the other sessions. So thank you all the speakers. Thank you, Susan.